Well, good morning, everyone. Um, we'll get going here. Uh, a little bit of uh, background to start. Um, my name is Rob Rees. I'm with Tesco, the Eastern Specialty Company. For those of you that are not familiar with Tesco, um, we provide uh, meter shop equipment, field equipment, um, down to meter seals, pre-wired boxes, inventory software, a full gamut of uh, products to uh, assist the uh, um, assist you in the utilities. Um, the company is out of uh, just outside of Philadelphia, but I'm um, I work from home in Indiana, so I'm much closer to you, and I cover the Upper Midwest. I've been out to NREA um, on site and in person a few times during the last few years, and I appreciate the opportunity here to. Um, present virtually um, on a couple topics in the next couple hours. Um, well, what we'll do here is do the first presentation. If it's if it um, ends a little bit early, uh, we will take a break and start the second presentation at the uh, scheduled time so that folks that are planning on hopping on to the second, not the first, they won't miss out if we start early. Um, so, uh, during the presentation, I just want to offer to everyone, there's going to be questions and uh, the availability for questions at the end, uh, but anytime during, um, uh, during the session, if you have questions, comment, please feel free to, to interject and, and holler out and uh, we can uh, uh, take care of your question right then. I want to keep this pretty casual. So, uh, with all that said, uh, in the next hour or so, uh, we will be discussing um, uh, transformer rated field meter testing and site verification. Um, so, what we'll be going over is, first of all, why site verification is important. It's more than testing the meter uh, accuracy. It tests the entire service, make sure that the entire meter service is in a healthy condition and that you're billing properly. Um, and then we will do an overview of what to do, um, uh, example tasks during a site verification. Um, then I want to break into, you know, we'll be discussing meter accuracy, CT accuracy. Um, and I want to break into a uh, little further detail in each of those test methods so that uh, you know what's going on in the theory behind what you're looking at when you execute a meter test, execute a CT test. And then we'll wrap up for questions afterwards. So, so like I said, uh, why is site, uh, site verification important? because it is testing more than just the meter accuracy. Um, the meter can be 100% accurate and you could still have something majorly wrong with the service. Um, you could have a safety issue um, first and foremost, and, or you um, could easily be underbilling or overbilling the customer depending on the failure mode. Uh, from the CTVs and PTs and the drops down to the meter. Um, a little background here, over the, in the 1900s, utilities, regulators, and customers, they typically would rely on lab and field meter testing efforts, were, and they were focused on the accuracy of the watt hour meter and the demand register. This focus has shifted with the deployment of AMR and AMI meters in the, um, throughout the U.S. Um, uh, in, nor in, in North America. It's shifted from just the accuracy of the meter to also checking other features of the meter. For instance, communications, the radio, disconnect uh, devices, disconnects under the glass, uh, checking for firmware versions and settings of the meter and then um, the overall meter installations on both residential and your commercial industrial customers. Incorrect or miscalculated site information or undetected problems 
can lead to an improperly metered customer not uh, related to the meter's accuracy and can also um, lead to potential safety issues. So, uh, like I said, there's been a shift. Um, electromechanicals the meters, um, they were subject to registration errors uh, because of mechanical issues. Um, friction wear, gear mesh alignment, broken gears, um, your magnetic bearings uh, wearing out and failing, and uh, the timing motors. And so you always had to consider uh, drift and a meter slow down with the, the old electromechanical meters. Now, solid state meters fail, um, but differently. Uh, first of all, their overall life expectancy is not nearly the same. An old electromechanical meter could be hanging on a house or a factory for 20, 30, 50 plus years. Um, the life expectancy of a um, solid state meter at this point is largely undefined. Uh, meter manufacturers um, will estimate, uh, but they all give different estimations, um, and we're seeing a wide range of life expectancies. Um, Um, the uh, why? Um, the, sorry, I had an incoming message. Um, we're seeing a large range of life expectancies with the solid state meters. Um, solid state meters tend not to drift or go out of accuracy. Um, there are the oddballs, uh, the one-offs, but typically that's unexpected. Failures are more catastrophic. Uh, you get power supply damage due to lightning uh, surges, transients on the line, LED display, LCD display um, issues, uh, problems with your um, problems with your um, uh, radio and such. Um, the failure modes include non-catastrophic but significant measure error modes. Um, sometimes these are attributed to improper meter programming and firmware issues. Um, so as you can see, um, solid state meters pose a much more broad uh, spectrum of failure modes than the old electromechanical meters. Okay, I lost my control here. There we go. So, um, to set up a best practices periodic uh, site verification program at your utility, yeah, you first have to look at a few things. Are you gonna test residential or just commercial uh, installations, your self-contained or transformer rated? Uh, the big rule of thumb here is just to follow the money and be as proactive as possible. It's, uh, it's important to remember that with current systems, it's not just the meter that can cause a major error in the measurement of a given serv a service. Uh, you can also have issues with the wiring, the CTs and PTs, um, and, a discrepancy, and discrepancies between what is thought to be at the site and is at what is actually at the site can be a major billing error. So like I said, the rule of thumb, follow the money. Um, uh, CI customers represent a disproportionately large amount of the overall revenue for every utility in North America. You might have a great majority of your meters being residential, say, 2Ss. It could be 80, 85, 90, 95% um, of your overall population. But it's going to be the few number of solid uh, or of uh, commercial industrial customers that will generate the largest revenue for your 
uh, for your utility. For some utilities, the 10% of their customers who have transformer rated metering services can re uh, represent over 70% of the overall revenue. Uh, these numbers can vary uh, utility to utility, but the basic overall premise should be the same for all utilities, and it's where you should focus your attention. And once again, just follow the money, uh, most bang for the buck. So to put together a program, you need to define what your largest customers are. And this should be defined by revenue. Uh, metering uh, losses and metering revenue is no longer recovered in, a case, uh, in the next case uh, rate case, nor is recovered metering revenue necessarily given back in the next rate case. Utility commissions um, have a lot less tolerance to the uh, to that in uh, in recent years. Um, this always presents a, a billing issues always present a public relations nightmare. So I want to give a little example here. Uh, food for thought: a facility with an electric bill of ten thousand per month will, would easily pay for a meter tech in two years if an error affecting the wiring of only one transformer, which is estimated revenue of 160,000 over a two-year period. Does this mean that the 10,000 10, per month um, or more defines large? We would argue at Tesco, yes. Yes, this would be a classic case of what you would consider a large customer. Next, you define, need to define when building a program, uh, what does periodically mean? If changes in usage, equipment failures in the metering service, extensional uh, damage to the service, or energy diversion at a single large customer, can, it can easily pay for a meter, uh, meter tech in just two to three years. And a single meter tech can handle several of these inspections in a single day. Then there's ample cost justification for inspecting these services at least once a year. Okay, any questions on um, the first uh, few slides we went over here, building a program and which uh, customers to focus in on? Okay. Now, um, I'm assuming the next couple slides are going to be um, review for a few of you, uh, you, but it's a segue into additional information I want to get to. Um, as we know, um, there's multiple meter forms out there, but they can be um, largely grouped into two categories, self-contained and transformer rated. Self-contained, I like to think of as direct metering and transformer rated as indirect metering. So for self-contained metering, primarily residential, 1S, 2S, 12S meters, and we're looking at relatively low current. You know, example, 100 amps here. And these installations, you can easily put a meter in series to the customer load. The meter can handle, a, a, a self-contained meter can easily handle the uh, loads you know, subject in a, in a residential or relatively low current installation. Here's an example of a um, self-contained metering installation. Your primary um, wiring through the masthead, through the electric meter, down through the load panel and out to the rest of the house. Pretty straightforward there. Alternatively, transformer rated metering, or like I uh, like to consider indirect metering, has a relative uh, where we're dealing with rel relatively high current levels, 400 amps, over a thousand amps, et cetera, et cetera. And just a side note, I know there is a typo here. I need to get that changed there. That's 16s. 
Um, but in, the, in these um, installations, putting a meter in series with the customer load is a big no-no. Uh, they're not equipped to handle those high currents. You would need a meter the size of a Volvo to, to handle the load um, if you put it directly in line with the customer load. So in these applications, we use a, um, a transformer rated meter and a series of PTs and CTs to drop down the primary voltages, uh, voltages and currents to a level that the meter can accept and measure accurately and safely. Typical components of an installation, and you will need to check all of these during a field verification, include your PTs, your CTs, typically a safety test switch, meter socket, and the meter itself. Now, um, once your program is developed, uh, thing uh, will shift to potential tasks to be completed on, on site. Uh, first of all, you would uh, double check the meter number, the location, the test result, and the meter records. Uh, perform first, perform a visual safety inspection of the site. Uh, this would include utility as well as customer equipment. Um, things to look for include intact down ground on pole, uh, properly attached enclosure, unwanted voltage on enclosure, uh, proper trimming and site tidiness, uh, look for discarded seals, um, vi uh, visually inspect for energy diversions. These could be intentional or not. These could be broken wire or missing wires, jumpers, an open test switch, unconnected wires, foreign objects, uh, or other metering equipment. Uh, please note that broken or missing wires can seriously cause an undermeasurement of energy. Um, a simple broken wire on a CT or VT can cause the loss of a third or half of the registration on a three element or two element metering. Uh, visually inspect lightning arresters and transformers for damage and leaks. Uh, check or prop, uh, for properly grounded and bonding of meter equipment. Uh, poor grounding and bonding practices may result in inaccurate measurements that go undetected for long periods of time. In, uh, implementing a single point grounding policy and practice can reduce and eliminate this type of issue. Um, execute a, a burden ratio and or admittance test on the CTs and voltage check the PTs. We'll get into burden ratio and admittance testing uh, a little more in depth um, later, uh, later in this session. Verify uh, the service voltage, um, a stuck regulator or seasonal capac uh, capacitor can impact service voltage. Uh, verify the con condition of the metering control wire. Uh, look for cracks in insulation, broken wires, loose connections, etc. cetera. Um, compare the test switch wiring and the wiring to the CTs and VTs. Um, and by doing this, you can quickly catch uh, any uh, cross wires, uh, reverse CTs, um, and be sure the CTs are grounded in one location only. Uh, check for a bad test switch, uh, look for corrosion, examine the voltage at the top and bottom of the switch. Also verify the amps with an amp probe on, um, on both sides of the test switch. Um, keep ro uh, check the rotation by closing uh, in one phase at a time at the test switch and observing the, the phase meter for forward rotation. Um, if forward rotation is not observed, measurements may be significantly impacted as the phases are most likely canceling each other out. Uh, execute a, uh, uh, a accuracy test on the meter and verify demand is applicable. Um, 
you can also ex uh, execute vector uh, measurements uh, and uh, observations. Traditionally, this has been done using instruments such as a circuit analyzer. Uh, however, uh, modern solid state meters have vector diagrams um, along with volt, amp, power factor values, and this can be used um, to check vectors on the meter display itself. Um, examining these values, it can provide much information about the metering integrity. It can prompt you that there might be wiring issues, um, unbalanced loads, et cetera. Um, and, and so um, modern meters has made this a lot easier for us. Um, if the metering is providing pulses, uh, uh, like uh, to the customer's SCADA systems. Um, those should be uh, also verified versus known load on the meter. If present, test and, uh, and inspect isolation relays, pulse splitters for things like brown blown fuses to ensure that they are operating properly. Um, verify the meter information, uh, the meter multiplier, uh, which we'll get into in the next uh, session. Uh, serial number, the dials, case of age, case of T and rate. Errors in this information uh, can also cause an adverse effect on measure, uh, measured reported values. Uh, before you uh, finish, make sure that the CT shunts are all open, uh, are not open, I'm sorry, um, and look for signs of excessive heat on the meter base. This is called a, uh, called a hot socket condition, and I will touch base with that on that um, uh, phenomenon uh, later in this session and next, I think next session. So any, uh, any questions thus far from anyone? on typical steps to execute during a uh, field site analysis? Okay, we will continue here. Um, we're gonna look at um, testing theory. I want to, in more detail, go over a meter accuracy test and a CT burden ratio and admittance testing. Um, and the associated equipment that you have on the market that um, can help you with these endeavors. First and foremost, though, the most important tools you have are your eyes and your brain. If you see anything wrong amiss, it could easily be a, most importantly, a safety concern, um, if not just a, um, uh, an issue, a failure mode that could lead to a billing, um, billing uh, error. And so just inspecting the service for all the telltale signs that we discussed earlier and then reacting accordingly, the, your eyes and your brain are by far your most important tools that you have. So for a meter accuracy test, uh, it's simply a comparison test. Um, this is one of the things that you need to execute at the, the meter installation. You need four things to execute a meter accuracy test. A lot of these are combined in modern equipment into one unit, but you need a energy reference standard, a potential source, a current source, and the meter under test. The watt hour meter, the first item, uh, what's it do? It measures electrical energy in kilowatt hours. As we know, your potential, your voltage times current equals power, and power over time is the energy recorded. Your energy reference standard, what does it do? Well, it measures electrical energy as well. It's essentially a meter. However, two, with two primary differences, a higher accuracy class, and it's also traceable to a national lab or, or SI. These two differentiating factors 
make it an energy reference standard for the test. Then you need a potential source and a current source. You will apply the same voltage and current to the standard and the meter for a defined period of time. The standard and the meter should measure the same energy during that period. However, the difference, any differences noted would be the error of the meter. So for, so for an example, in a given period of time, if the standard registers, say, 100 kilowatt hours and the meter registers 101.38, kilowatt hours, then the error of the meter is 1.38%. Pretty straightforward. Everybody, any questions? Okay. We will switch gears now to um, ratio burden and admittance testing. Like I said earlier at the beginning, of this session, even if your meter is 100% accurate, if there's an issue with your CTs, um, you could easily have billing, uh, billing errors. So we're going to use an example of a 9S meter installation. In this example, you have three CTs on the primary lines uh, going to the customer. These CTs provide a drop down. A, um, they lower the uh, current uh, and with their associated PTs, to voltages and current that the meter can handle accurately and safely. Everything, all the information that you need to execute a ratio and burden test is on the face plate of the CT, much like all the information that you need to execute a meter test is on the face plate of the meter. For a ratio test, you would look for the ratio specification. Here on this face plate, it's listed as 300 to 5. That means if you apply 300 amps to the primary, you're going to see five amps on the secondary. And this, uh, once again, I have this slide, a CT with 400 to five ratio will produce five amps on the secondary when 400 amps are applied to the primary. For your burden testing, you, you would locate the burden specification on the face plate of the CT. And here's an example, 0.3% of burdens of 0.1 to burdens of 1.8. The burden range present in the secondary circuit, that, uh, and so what is the burden rating? The burden range it, present in the secondary circuit that the manufacturer will guarantee their CTs will still accurately function in regards to the ratio specification. This basically puts a um, operating range on the CT. And if you, if you put too much burden on the secondary, all bets are off on the accuracy of that CT in that installation. So for ratio testing, it's pretty straightforward. You take a reading of the primary current and then typically through the safety test switch, take a secondary current measurement, and those and that will give you your your ratio, your actual ratio in that installation. And then you compare that to what was on the faceplate of the CT. So ratio testing is pretty straightforward. Switching gears to burden testing. Um, burden testing tests the CT in a real world condition with burden on the secondary loop. Um, during burden testing, we assume 
incorrectly assume that the burden on the secondary loop is initially zero. Now, we, we know that is incorrect, but for natures of the test, we initially incorrectly assume that it's zero. We know it's incorrect because we know that the wiring, the test switch, all interconnect points, the coils in the meter, all these components will apply some burden to the secondary drop of the CT, but it should be negligible. So using this uh, example burden spec, 0.3% at burdens of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5. So what that means is that there should be less than a 0.3% drop or change in the secondary current from the initial reading of zero burden when up to five ohms of burden is applied to the secondary. Multiple units um, out on the market that are available to execute this testing. A couple of them are shown here. These units internally to the units um, there are a series of resistors and inductors that allow the units to apply the additional ANSI burden values or test points of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 1, 2, 4, and 8. So when you execute a burden test, you initially the unit will initially take a current measurement of the secondary of the service, your quote unquote zero burden test point, and then the unit will apply additional burden in series to that secondary loop and take a second measurement. I like to graph these measurements out as you see, you have your burdens here, your initial 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 1, 2, 4, and 8. And the reading that was given at each of these points. If you graph these out, you will see a plot like this, where you will see a definite knee or drop off as you get to those higher values. But more specifically in this example that we're looking at with this specification, 0.3% at burdens of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 0.5, the critical point in this test is this burden here. The CT manufacturer is not guaranteeing performance past 0.5 ohms of burden. So scaling in to the graph, we see at this point, at 0.5 ohms of burden, the secondary current is still at 4.99 amps from the initial reading of 5. That is less than a 0.3% change, so we have a good CT. Any questions on burden testing at this point? Anyone? Okay. We'll shift gears to the last CT test method, admittance testing. Um, admittance testing measures the overall health of the secondary loop of the CT. The unit me of measure is millisiemens. Admittance is the inverse of impedance, and impedance is the opposition to current. So once again, admittance tests the overall health of the secondary side of the CT. How does it do this? Uh, admittance devices inject a high frequency sine wave signal into the secondary loop of the CT. We know what the voltage used to send the signal is. We read the resulting current 
from these two measurements and parameters, the, the impedance and the admittance can be calculated. Now, the caveat to admittance testing is that the results are not an, as initially intuitive as, say, a ratio or burden test. Uh, some further analysis is, is needed. So, for instance, if you execute an admittance test and you receive a value back of, say, 12 millisiemens, what does that mean? Is that a pass? Is it a fail? Is that a good CT or not? Well, it is recommended that you do a three-step process when doing admins testing. First of all, test, test each CT individually. If you get a, the 12 millisiemens, the 25 millisiemens, that's not uh, immediately um, a failure of the CT. Um, you are essentially checking at this stage for opens and shorts, if the CT is shunted, for example. Then, step two, if you have a match set of CTs, as say as in a 9S installation, and they're a match set, there's the same manufacturer, model number, and ratio, and you run an admittance testing on, on all three, and say you get values of, say, 12.3, 12.5, and then 18. Well, you have two that are really close together, and then one seems like it's out in the weeds. That could be an indication that something is wrong in that phase of the meter installation. Then thirdly, it is recommended to, to periodically um, test, uh, retest over time. Optimally, it's best to be able to uh, execute an admittance test at the time of installation of the CT. And I know that is not always necessarily available uh, or applicable, but optimally, you would start at the installation of the CT and then every and record those records and then over time every three four six months go back and retest again and then look how the current results relate to previous results and if you see one slowly drifting away that could be a telltale sign that you um, might have an issue with that particular ct or CT secondary loop. So that's a, a caveat to admins testing is the results are not in, immediately intuitive. Uh, it takes a little more brain work to analyze the results. The big uh, pro of admins testing is that it is the only CT test um, testing method that can be executed in no load conditions. The burden rate and ratio tests, by a rule of thumb, need at least 10% of the rated current on the CT to execute a legitimate, accurate test. But in the case of admittance testing, you do not need customer load. And especially out in Nebraska, this is particularly important uh, with all the irrigation systems. You might be assigned to test a meter installation on one of those irrigation rigs, and it's not currently pumping, and so you have no load, where an admittance test would still allow you to test the health of, those, uh, of that installation. Any questions on admittance testing? Okay. Now, one last thing, and, and but very importantly to look um, look for, is signs and conditions of hot sockets. Uh, the picture in the center shows some symptoms of hot sockets. Uh, 
melted back planes, burnout blades, pitted blades. Uh, here a chunk has been cut out uh, due to the arcing conditions uh, of a hot socket. Uh, many years ago, Tesco, in conjunction with Landis and Gear, did a study uh, to get down to the root cause of hot sockets. Uh, they're by no means a new issue in, in the utility world, but in recent years, because of all the AMI projects, uh, millions and millions of meters have been swapped out from the old electromechanical meters, which were great heat sinks. Uh, to solid state meters, which are very um, uh, feature rich uh, and, and a lot of additional functionality, but primarily plastic and more susceptible to high temperature conditions. Uh, we found through our study with Landis and Gear that a majority of hot socket conditions are caused by a lack of jaw tension in the meter socket itself. And there's a, a couple units on the market shown here, which allows you to test for that um, adequate jaw tension while you have the meter um, out of the uh, meter socket. This is very important um, test to execute during a site verification because no one wants and the bad publicity of um, something happening at a customer site due to hot sockets. I provided uh, some references here. Um, this presentation will be on Tesco's website, tescometering.com. If you want to come back for further, um, uh, further look and more detailed look on this topic. So with that, any questions? We covered a lot of material here, so anything? Once again, once again, Rob, we've got a quiet group on the other end, it looks like. Yeah, yep. <laughs> um,